I, I want us to uh, Romans chapter 8. And I, I went through this morning and I was, I was reading and tried to anticipate uh, what today's uh, message was going to be about. And uh, I, I don't know if some of us know this. I know that news kind of go quickly, of, especially bad news. Uh, but we started with the earthquake in, in Haiti. Then there was an earthquake in Japan. Then there was an earthquake in China. And now there was an earthquake in Chile. And I don't think that earthquakes are finishing. I think that we are progressively uh, getting stronger. So I want us to look at chapter 8. We're going to begin in verse 18, but let me go back a little. We're not going to read it. I'm just going to go, go and paraphrase a little. In chapter 7, Paul was speaking about being a slave. And he was speaking about being a slave to sin. That all of us have come from being slaves to sin. And we were slaves for the reason of what we obeyed. Whatever we obeyed, is, that's what we're slaves to. So when we were sinners, we obeyed to sin. And that was our master. And we are now in Christ, and our new master is Jesus. And we are still slaves, but we are not slaves any longer to sin. He went on speaking about the law in chapter 7 and how uh, we were, uh, in a way, brought under uh, because of the law. The law was not bad. The law was good. But the law showed us how we needed God. But because the law happened to, to come, we had this promise. You know, like when you first tell uh, uh, your, your child no, that's the first word you know a baby learns is no. The more you say no, the more the child wants to do what you say not to do. And that was the same effect of the law. God gave the law, and all of a sudden, because there was a law, we had something that we can break. And as human nature, we want to break the laws which are given to us not to do. There's something about the don't do that seemed to just bring uh, this extra energy in our lives that we want to do. In the beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, there were not ten commandments. There, there was only one and I can say it in Old Testament type of language so we can understand it. So when God spoke to Adam, he say, uh, Thou must not eat of the tree. The day that you eat from the tree, you shall surely die. But you have every tree that's good for food all around you. You notice the pride of, of man. We didn't want all the ones around us. We wanted the one we couldn't have. So when God created the law, the Ten Commandments that were given to us, all of a sudden we want to do that which we know we're not supposed to do. So the law brought death. Now, I know that sometimes when I speak I have to be uh, very emphatic because I know we can kind of not understand sometimes. But we, before the law there was already death. But the, the law just encouraged people to sin. That was not what God intended. That's how people are. So, after we learned all of this, this is in chapter 7. If you have time to go read through chapter 7, I do encourage you to do so. It's not an easy chapter to, to, to read, especially because we have new ones since like in chapter uh, 7, verse 14. Uh, let me read it. It says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. The law is spiritual. We cannot understand spiritual things by being natural. Sold as a slave to sin, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I have, I do. What I hate, I do. Now, there's a lot, a lot of do's. Yeah, I saw all of a sudden someone just shake their heads like, okay, we'll do it again. Verse 15, I do not understand what I do. That sounds like us, right? You did something that you're not supposed to do. Do you understand why you did it? No, none of us understand. It was just an urge. So we did it. 
I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. Uh, uh, let me explain it this way. You set a goal for tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm off and I'm going to do this and this and this and this and this and this. And I have all this work at the house to do and I'm going to do it tomorrow. And when you wake up, you say, I feel tired. I'm just going to stay in bed. Did you do what you wanted to do? No, you didn't do what you wanted to do. You find yourself doing that which you didn't want to do. Does it make sense now? Because of all the do's, we kind of miss it. Then we continue. Verse 16. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. The law is good. Repeat. Romans seven sixteen. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it's sin living in me. Does that make any sense? That's almost like, you know, a, you are another person. There's another person living inside of you, and the other person does whatever that person feels like doing, and then you're kind of stuck because you want to do something else. Said, so, Well, let me si simplify it. You're made up of three parts. The body, the soul, and the spirit. The body, what does the body want? The body always wants to return from whence it came from. The body came from the ground, so the body's always trying to go back to the ground. When you find people doing despicable things, they're trying to return from where they came from. The average age of a prostitute in the United States is 12 and 13 years old, but their pimp's average age is 35 to 40. Does that make sense? Isn't it against the law for a grown-up to uh, lay with a 12-year-old? How come we don't have more of a crackdown than that? You know how the pimp gets the girl? He sits there and tells her how pretty she is and how nice she is and makes the little girl fall in love with him and next thing you know, she's a prostitute. You see, if we were trying to pull the girl for good things, it don't matter how much I tell her she's pretty, She's going to look at me like something wrong with you. You're up to something. You want something. Because I want something good. But if I want something bad, the little girl will go with me. So you see, we are naturally always trying to go back to what's wrong, what's bad, what's evil. But then when we are born again, our spirit is born again. So our spirit has the higher influence. So all of this is a preview for verse 18 on chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 18. I consider that our present suffering are not worth compare with the glory that will be revealed in us. Are you going through any suffering? Uh, most of us, not really. Are we going to go through suffering eventually? Yes, we, we will. I was considering this week. Why God invented such a thing as marriage? You ever stop to consider that? Why did God ever create this type of union? You're going to have a man and a woman coming together who are naturally opposite. The opposite from a man is a woman. The opposite from a woman is a man. They are natural opposites. So as natural opposites, you're going to have even their brain function to work differently. The woman uh, uses her brain globally while the, the man uses his brain in, in compartments, logic and emotion. We, we're not the same at all. Now, you can look at our blood type, we're the same. You can look at our lungs, and it acts the same in our hearts and our liver and our kidneys. But even our reproduction organs are different. So we are different. And we come together in a union, and we find that inside the union, we don't always agree. So why did God create such a thing? I believe that God created a, a marriage for the purpose of us understanding God. See, we don't get our way in marriage. And if you do, then you need to check your marriage out. You don't always get your way. You have to find a middle ground. So in our body, we, we do the same thing. You can't just do whatever you want to do because you just felt like doing it. You know, marriage should have taught you that. You can't just watch whatever you want to watch. 
No, marriage should have taught you that. You know, so we can grab what we've learned in our relationship with one another and apply it to ourselves and end up growing from it. I cannot just watch pornos because I felt like watching pornos. Well, why not? Because m- my wife wouldn't let me. Is that a reason? Well, that's a start. I know you want to get all spiritual all of a sudden. I want to first start natural. I know that we have to have higher goals, but we need to find a starting place. So our current suffering, sometimes in marriage, you may say I'm suffering. Whatever you're suffering cannot be compared to what you're going to receive. In uh, in countries where Christians are martyred today, sometimes they are whipped until they're, they're dead, they're beaten to death, and all they can think of is my current suffering is it cannot be compared with the glory that I'm going to receive. The creation waits in eager expectation from the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Now all the world, the, the earth that we live in, the sky that we look up to in the daytime that is blue, at nighttime is, is black with the stars that we can see, the sun that we see, the moon which comes out at night, Everything that we find to be in nature, it is groaning as one expecting a child. Now, if we've had all our ladies, thank God they were married first, all of them have given birth to at least one child. So I can speak in terms where the women would understand. Well, all the men here have had children, too, with their wife. Thank God they got married first. That's the order that God placed. Do you remember that helpless feeling you had when your wife was having that contraction? When all you can do is just grab the hand and say you can squeeze if you need to. When you look at them and you have that little prayer inside your your mind going on, Father, help her. This is rough. Men, how many of us would actually do that? How many of us would actually say, yeah, I want to get pregnant? You know, God knew what he was doing when he made a woman because uh, we would have died out in Adam. I guarantee you, you would have to just for the whole entire, from the beginning to the end, from the first thing to the last thing, you would have to sedate me because I'm like, no way am I going through that. God knew what he was doing. But when you had that contractions, the contractions started and then they were not very often. You had a little one and it kind of took you by surprise because it was the first one. And you go, ooh, I think that's a contraction. You remember the first one? The one that I think? It hurt, but you weren't sure. And then you get to the hospital and they ask the question, how far apart is it? And then, not only that, they decide to check and see how many centimeters you have. Now, when we look upon the earth, and the earth is groaning as a, someone expecting a child, how do you think those contractions work? How do you think that we who are on earth are going to feel the contractions? Oh, there's going to be movement underneath. And they're going to come more often. (laughs) And they're going to get stronger. And who tells the poor earth, hold on, you can hold my hand? Well, why is the earth doing this? Because of one reason. It was brought under frustration. Someone put it under frustration. What does that mean? Well, when Adam... And Eve fell, the earth was brought under a curse. Did you read it? It's in Genesis. What was the curse? Hey, 
First Adam, you curse this way. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your bread. You're going to have to work the land. The land is not going to automatically produce for you. You're going to have to work it. Wait a second. You cannot say something is a curse if it was not different beforehand. Beforehand, there was not such a thing as you had to work the earth. It was very, very simple. The earth knew how to work itself. Do you know that God has put in every tree the ability to work its own self? Nobody has to work it. You can go through the Amazon jungle. There has been no farmers in the Amazon jungle in certain regions. Man has not even passed through there. But here comes a, a crazy man deciding that he wants to show nature. Walking through the Amazon jungle with a camera. And here he finds a tree full of ripe mangoes and monkeys. Who planted the tree there? How did that tree get there? There was no farmer. Nobody grabbed the seed and put it in the ground and said, here, grow. There was no fertilizer applied to it, and nobody watered it. It happened all by itself. I was watching where uh, apples came from. It's a miracle. We have apples in the United States. They're not from here. Apples are from Russia. You ever stop to consider that? Our great apple orchards that we have in the United States, and they're not from here. And do you know the apples that we eat? They don't come from seeds. Oh man, I can I can do a message on this. The reason why the apples that we eat do not come from seeds is that inside the apples, uh, their their own seeds carry all the genes of every apple tree. So if you pack the seed of the apple tree, you're gonna get whatever comes up. So you can plant a Macintosh seed, but you will not get a Macintosh apple. You're most likely going to get an apple that it's unedible. It is sour. It's bitter. So for all the seeds that were planted in the United States, 90% of the apples that came forth were all bitter, unedible, so they made wine out of it what they call wine cider hard cider <laughs> but where is all that stuff it's inside the apple in its seed all of the history of the apple tree it's inside one apple god created it that way but when it was, the earth was brought under frustration, the earth cannot function in its normal way. It's waiting for something. It's waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. What does that mean? Well, let's say it in simple form. In the beginning, the earth was functioning right because you had the sons of God upon the earth doing what they were told to do. Who were the sons of God? Not angels. I'm talking about Adam and Eve. They're the sons of God under God's authority, under God's reign, under God's glory. It's so funny. I was reading a book, the book of Adam. It's not uh, in the canon of the Bible, so we don't consider it to be accurate or historical it's just some light reading but according to the book of Adam um, they fell in within two hours of being made and they thought that when night fell that was their curse they thought they were going to be in darkness forever because they had never seen night before we don't know how the earth would have normally function. I need to say that again. We don't know how the earth would have naturally functioned. We know that when God made it, God said it was good. But when man fell, there was something that shifted in the cosmos. Something went on to where the earth feels like, okay, this is not right. How would the earth have been before? Well, I know some things from Scripture. There were no thistles. 
what are thistles? In my country, we have these little grass that grows that have those little thorns on it. We used to play with it. We'll grab it and chase everybody with it, and it will stick to their clothes. Then we moved to Miami, Florida, and we discovered that there were a different breed of the same thing. Because in my, in my home country, they will only stick to your clothes. In Miami, Florida, they'll stick to your skin. And they'll pierce through. And we were used to walking barefoot, and we only had to avoid one particular plant. And it was the coolest plant you can see, because the moment you touched it, all the leaves closed. And we had to avoid that one, because if you stepped on it, it hurt. Now, it didn't... It didn't really pierce you as bad as the thistles in Miami did, but, you know, it still reminded you you were walking barefoot. There were no none of that before the fall of man. It was to almost, you can plant the seed and just watch it grow. That's the nature of seeds. Plant it, let it grow. It's going to come up in its season. We don't do that anymore. Do you know that you plant a seed and not every seed you plant grows? There's some dead seeds. They're not going to grow. <laughs> I've done some of those before. Planted the flower seeds and it's like, wow, I planted, uh, the whole thing is planted and here come four flowers. I mean, man, I could have just bought some flowers for that instead of the seeds. Not all seeds are going to grow. But there was a time to where all seeds did grow. So we're looking at the news and saying, ah, the earth is going to end soon. That's not scriptural. So let me relieve you. The earth is not going to end. God's not bringing an end. I know that we're going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. So it can't be that it's ending. But is the earth trying to do something? Yes. The earth is trying to bring forth the revelation of the sons of God. The earth is saying, it's time. It's getting to be that time. Stop playing and come forth. You know what women do when they're having those contractions? And they get to where they get to that breaking point? You know what I've heard women scream? They scream the same word. No matter which country they come from, or what language they speak, or what religious viewpoint they have. It doesn't matter if they're Republican or, or Democrat. It don't ma matter even if they, if they are communists. They all have the one thing in common. They said, get it out of me. I can't take it anymore. Get it out. You, you imagine something being universal? Now, how do you think the earth feels? She's been pregnant for a very long time. We're getting to see it now. The Bible tells us that we can know the time. That's how we can look at the seasons when things begin to happen in natural progression, the time is coming. Coming for what? Oh, we're not going to be here very much longer. We who are in Christ, I'm waiting to be caught up in the air to meet Him. I'm ready. I'm ready to see the Jesus that I put my trust in. I'm ready, but unfortunately, most of the world isn't. Most of the world isn't ready. Some of us are still having issues with the law in our own selves. We're still in chapter 7, where, you know, I haven't gotten to the place to where grace exists. I am still subject to the I'm still a slave to the law. We're still trying to get ourselves right to go from chapter 7 so we can work on chapter 8. So I can help other people. Well, if anything can encourage you, 
watch the movement of time. We should know when it's time to be serious. When the games have finished being played. We should know. We already can hear the orchestra warming up. They're about to start any time. You hear the orchestra warming up, the first thing you do is you stop your conversation to whom you're speaking to and find your seat and sit down. You can feel it, can't you? It's getting close. So now I need to buckle down, get myself together. All the things that I used to do, that I allowed my flesh to do, I should not have my flesh having dominion over me any longer. Because the time is near. If anybody ever found the cure of cancer, and they kept that cure to themselves, and watched as people would die from cancer around them, and you found out after 20 or 30 years that they had a cure, what would you say to that person? Let me tell you, many will come to the Father. And God is going to tell them, depart from me, I knew you not. But if they can look on your face and say, you knew all the time and you never told me. How would you look back at them? It's time. As uh, the Winans would say it. It's about that time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for revealing to us who know you, your plans. Father, things that are spiritually understood cannot be understood in the natural. Father, we know that we were sent here for your purpose, not for our own. We know that it is your will and not our will. We know that obeying you is what we were created to, to do, but Lord God, is not always easy to obey. Father, we ask you, Lord God, to give us the strength that we need to accomplish the task that you have set before us. Lord God, for greatness lies in every single one of us. Father, but when we continue to go opposite of the direction that you have called us to, Lord God, we lose the sight of that greatness in us. Father, we ask you, Lord God, to give us again the joy of our salvation. Lord God, that day that we were born again, that we wanted to share with everybody who you are and what you've done for us and how you've changed us and redeemed us. Lord God, give us back that fervor. Lord God, give us back that joy, Lord God. Lord God, satisfy our mouth with good things, Lord God. Lord God, let our youth be renewed like the eagle, that we will run and not be weary. Lord God, that we will walk and not faint, Father. Father, we have much to do, Lord God, and sometimes the aching bones get in the way. Lord God, is part of the curse which has been given to this earth, that we grow old and we grow weary. But we thank you, Lord God, that you can strengthen us again. Renew our minds, Lord God. Make it new again each day as we wake up. Lord God, that we can be joyful in seeing you again, Lord God. In our mind's eye as we see the greatness of who you are. Lord God, how you're greater than everything that you have created. Father, and we have to remember that as we're going through our day. For we lessen you by our problems. Lord God, you are great. You are mighty. You are just, Lord God. Father, and you wish that none will per perish, but that all will come to repentance. Father, we align ourselves with your desire, and also wish that none would perish. Let our mouth be an open mouth in the time that it should be open. Lord God, we ask you in the name of Jesus. Amen.